Hi everyone! In this video, you will learn how to export your game on Windows, Linux, Android, Web, and Mac, how to make a demo for your game, and even how to add a DLC. Now here, I prepared a silly little project, which is basically just a cookie clicker copy. And yeah, it allows me to click on this cashew, and the number of caches clicked raises. Okay, now I'm gonna use this to export on different platforms. And if I want to actually export it, I have to go to project and click on export. And here I can add a template. So you see here, I have a bunch of different templates. And if I wanted to export for desktop, you see that I have a bunch of errors here. Now these errors appear for all other platforms. So if I look for web again, I have these errors for Linux, for Mac, for Android. You see, I have a bunch of errors. And what these errors are telling me is that I do not have the export templates available. To make those templates available, I could either click on manage export templates, or I could go to editor and manage export templates. Here, I can simply click on download and install, and all the templates are going to be downloaded. Okay, now we can go to our project and export. And in this menu, you'll see that we no longer have those errors. We only have this message telling us that the RC edit tool must be configured in the editor settings. What this means is that we need some program that is able to edit resources of an executable so that we can change the icon or we can change some metadata of our executable. I'll add a link in the description for this, but basically you can go to the RC Edit repository and just go to releases. And here, if you click on RC Edit x64 or x86, depending on your architecture, you can simply download this file. After downloading RC Edit, you can go to editor and editor settings. And in here, if you search for RC Edit, you will see that under export windows, we have here to configure the location of our RC Edit executable. And I have it here in my cache clicker folder. I click open and now my RC Edit is configured. Now, if I go to project and export again, you'll see that I have no warning at all. Having all of this configured, let's start with the most important one first with the web. Now the minimal configuration basically needs no changes from us. We can simply just click on export project. And in here, maybe let's make a new folder. Let's call it exports. And in here, let's make another folder. Let's call it web. And we can save cashewclicker.html. Now you'll see that in my exports folder inside web, I have here a bunch of files. Now your first instinct might be to simply go and double click on cashewclicker.html. And this is going to throw an error. And this happens because our files need to communicate. And generally, browsers don't allow directly running WebAssembly as it could pose some security issues. So our solution is to start a local server on which to host our game. And the easiest way of doing that is with Python. Now Python can be installed in many ways. I'll add links in the description for everything, but basically on Windows, we can click on the Windows installer to download it, or we could go to the Microsoft store to download it. And on Linux, you might already have it. Now that we have Python, all we have to do is to right click and open this in a terminal. Here, we can simply write python3 m http dot server. This is going to start an HTTP server in our local host under the port 8000. So if I come to my browser, I can write localhost 8000 and you'll see that it shows me the files that I have in this folder. And now if I click on cashewclicker.html, the game is going to run and as you can see, I can click on my cashew. While this is useful for debugging, it's not really useful for when we want to share our game with other players. If we want to do that, we can do so through itch.io. Itch.io is a platform which is especially good for sharing games and for playing games in the browser and really, really good for game jams, which are basically just contests for game developers. So. If you want to make a game and add it to each I.O., you can go to the dashboard and in the dashboard, you can click on create new project. Now you could give this any kind of title. I'm going to give it cashew clicker and you'll see that the project URL gets automatically generated. And when you select the kind of project, you have to select HTML because we just generated a web project. Now, of course, you can select here a lot of other settings, pricing and whatever. 
but we're not going to get into too many details. What we can do though is to upload files. Now you see here that we need to upload a zip containing your game. And there must be an index.html file in the zip. So what I have to do is to come here to the cache clicker and rename this file to index.html. Now I can select everything. I can send to a zip folder and you see that I have cache clicker.zip. If I click on upload files, I go to web and I select cache clicker.zip. I open and my game is basically uploading. Okay, now that our game has been uploaded, I can simply select this file will be played in a browser. And if I go to the bottom, I can just save this as a draft. So I only see it myself and I can click now on view page. And you see that I have here this loading game for the first time. And if I click on run game, I should be able to slowly see my game getting started. And now, as you can see, in the same way, I can click on the cashew as many times as I want. And if you do not like this resolution, you can always go back to edit the game. And here at the bottom, you can specify the resolution to be anything else you want to make it larger or smaller. I'm going to make this game public soon after the tutorial, so you can come and play yourself if you want. Now for Windows, this is going to be much easier because all we have to do is to export our project. And let's just go one step back and create a new folder, call it Windows. And in here, I'm just going to make cashewclicker.exe. I'm going to save it. And as you can see, if I go to exports windows, I have cashewclicker.exe. And if I start it, I can simply play my game. And the same story applies for Linux. So if I go to Linux, I can export the project. Again, go to Linux. And in here, I can save Cashew Clicker. So I hit save. Now, I do not have a Linux system, and that's why I created a virtual machine. But basically, in this virtual machine, I added all the files that have been generated for my game here. And I should be able to run the files. However, these files do not have the ability to be executed. So I have to change this with the chmod command. But first of all, let's see that that's the case. So ls-la will show me that these do not have execution rights because you see there is no X character here, which symbolizes that it's executable for either the root, the user and the group. But we're getting into details. So if I want to change this, I could simply say chmod and I can write plus X because I want to add this ability to execute them and just select the file that I want to be able to execute. So I want to be able to execute cashew clicker dot sh. And I also want to be able to execute the other one. So 86 underscore 64. Okay. And now if I list everything, you'll see that I have this axis here and I can simply double click on this and my game is going to start. So as you can see, again, I can click as many times as I want on the cashew and it's working as expected. Now, if we move on to Android, you'll see that we still have an error here saying that a valid Android SDK path is required in the editor settings. So if we go to our editor settings, you'll see here that under Android, we have a Java SDK path and an Android SDK path. Now it could be possible that you do not have either of these two. So I'll walk you through getting both of those. For the JDK, you can go to adoption.net and download the version of OpenJDK that you want, or you could go to Java downloads on oracle.com. And in here you could get basically the same thing, but from Oracle. Now I'm also telling you about this because most developers already have the JDK from Oracle. So if you do have it, then you no longer need to download anything. Now the installation process should be pretty simple, but after you finish installing, you have to make sure that the environment variables are exported properly. So what I'm going to do is go to my start menu and write run. And in here I can write sysdm.cpl and after clicking OK, I can go to advanced and then environment variables. Now here I have to scroll down until I find Java home and GRE home. Now you have to check these files and see if they match with your actual Java installation folder. So if I double click on this one and control C, I can go to my folder here and control V 
And you see that it takes me to Java JDK 23, which is perfectly fine. But in your program files, you might have some other JDKs and you should be pointing to those instead. But for me, JDK 23 is perfectly fine. Now, one other thing you might want is to have your Java executables under your path system variable. And to do that, you have to go down and find this path system variable and you can click on edit and under here, you can add your variable. Now, for example, I have it, but if I wanted to, let's say, add it again, what I would have to do is to identify where my Java JDK is and go into the bin folder. Now, under this bin folder, I can click here and Ctrl C to copy. And if I click here on new, I can press Ctrl V to paste. And if I click OK, of course, I have in my path this thing, but now I have it twice, so I'm going to delete it. And if you want to check that everything works, you can open a terminal. And in this terminal, if I write Java, you'll see that I see some information. So I'm being able to easily access all these executables. Okay, now that we have everything set up for Java SDK, we can go to Java SDK path and simply select the folder in which the JDK is installed. So if I click on this, for me, the folder is program file slash Java slash JDK 23. For you, it could be wherever you want it to install Java. If I select the current folder, you see that the URL is set up. Now for Android SDK, what do we do? For that, the docs tell us that we can either install the Android SDK through Android Studio, or we can install it through the SDK Manager command line tool. Now, in my opinion, the SDK Manager command line tool is much more lightweight and actually easier to use, but if you want, you can try installing Android Studio and it's going to work similarly. Now, in order to get the command line tools, we have to go to this instructions link. And from here, I'll go to the Android Studio download page. Now you don't have to navigate through all these. I'm going to share with you directly the Android Studio download page. And if we go to the bottom of it, you'll see that we find here command line tools only. Now, depending on your platform, you can select whatever zip you want. And after you finish downloading, you can simply go to the archive and extract everything. And we can now move on to the next steps in the documentation, which are basically running this SDK manager command. So if I copy this, I can right click and open everything in a new terminal. And if I control V, I can paste this command. Now, before we press enter, very important is that we have to specify what the SDK root is here. And the SDK root is basically just saying where we want to actually install this SDK. And if I simply say dot, it means that I want to install everything in the same folder that I'm running this command from. So basically under Android SDK. And one other thing that I have to change is to also change the location of this SDK manager. Because if we look in our Android SDK folder, there is no SDK manager inside. However, if we go under command line tools and under bin, you will see that we have SDK manager dot bat in here. So where was the SDK manager? Well, it's in the current folder slash command line tools. So CMD line tools slash bin. And in here we have the SDK manager. Okay. Now if I press enter, you'll see that some process starts and it asks me to accept and I accept everything. And now basically everything is downloading. Okay, now that everything is installed, we can go back to Android SDK and we see here that we have a bunch of other things. So the next steps would be to simply go to our editor and just add the Android SDK path. So let's just copy this and let's go back here and put the Android SDK path here. And now if I close, if I go to project export, you see that under Android, I no longer have any other errors. So what I have to do is to simply press again, export project. And of course, not under Linux, I'm going to export it under Android. And you see that I have this APK file. If I hit save, the APK file is getting created. Okay, and now if I look under my Android folder, you'll see that I have this APK, which I can share with anyone so they can play my game. Okay, so I've actually decided to share the game with myself and if I open it, you'll see that here I have this cashew and the game is looking exactly the same as before and I can click on the cashew and 
Yeah, it's basically the same game, but on my phone. Now finally, for macOS, I asked for help in the Godot community and someone under the name Crayon Ape was kind enough to show me how they did exports under macOS. And it's as simple as we do it on Windows and on Linux. And as you can see, it can also be run and played normally. Now, before moving on, on Mac, you might encounter an error saying that you have an invalid bundle identifier. And what the bundle identifier basically is, is just a reverse DNS. So if your game is under, I don't know, uh, cashew.com, then you would simply write com.cashew.game, for example. And afterwards, you can move on and export your project just as usual. Now, sadly, I also wanted to add something for iOS, but since neither me nor Crayon Abe has a developer account, we couldn't move forward with this one. But other than that, and other than these yellow warnings, we faced, for now at least, no other issues. But in any way, if I find a video or if anyone else does, I'll attach it in the description. Now, the next feature that I'd like to show you is, well, features. And the features are basically a very simple capability of the Godot exporter, as they are basically tags for which you can check in your code. So Godot has a bunch of default feature tags. And for example, I could check if some player is playing either on Windows or is playing on web. So how would I do that? Well, I could go, let's say, to my canvas layer and to my label game. Let's add a new script and let's call it label game.gd. And under here, I could say that the text is going to be equal to peanut clicker 3000. And now if OS dot has feature, what feature? If it has the feature windows, then we want to also add to this text. So text plus equals to dash windows. Okay, else if OS dot has feature, let's say web, then we can say text plus equal and dash web. And finally, else we can simply say something like, I don't know, text plus equal other platform. Okay, now that we saved this, if I am going to project and export, I could go to Windows desktop and you see that this has the Windows feature in the feature list and I can export the project under Windows and I can do the same for web. So again, export the project under web. Now, if I go back to my game directory, you'll see that under Windows, if I enter the cache clicker, I have here dash Windows. Okay, but if I were to go to the web one, I will have again to start my server. So let's just write Python 3-m HTTP server. And now if I open localhost 8000, you see that I have been at clicker 3000-web. Now, what's absolutely amazing about this is that you can also define your own tags. And this is where we can create a demo for our game. So, for example, if we were to come back to Godot, we could add a new copy of this Windows desktop preset. And let's call this desktop uh, demo. Why not? So now under features, I could simply say here demo. And now anything that I want to remove from the game, I just have to put under an if statement. So for example, let's say that I just want this particle queue to no longer be shown. What, ca what I can do is to simply write func ready. And if OS dot has feature demo, we are going to hide this. So particle queue dot hide. Now, obviously this is <laughs> definitely not the way to no longer have these particles because the particles are still going to be there, but only hidden. You probably just want to not have the particles at all, but this is a simple example. So if I now save, I can go again to project export and I can export this project and let's maybe put it under I don't know, win demo. And here, if I save it, now if I go again into the folder under win demo, you'll see that I'll no longer see any particles. This is just a demo variant of the game. If you want to see the particles, you have to buy the game. <laughs>
Now, one other cool feature that feature tags have is the fact that you can configure projects based on which feature the project is using. So, for example, again, if we were to go to our demo feature, what we could do is add properties specific only to demo. So maybe we wanted the demo to have a different size. We could select this viewport and again, select demo. And now I can click on add and you'll see that this viewport demo option has been added and I can change this viewport width to, I don't know, maybe only 1026. And now if I wanted, I could go to project and export and select again the desktop demo, export the project, overwrite the previous demo that we exported. And if I were to look in my cashewclicker.exe, which is under Win Demo, if I double click it, you see that the resolution now is terrible, but this means that the game settings for our demo are working properly. If you're watching this video, chances are you're either a game developer or someone who's passionate about becoming one. In that case, it's time to level up your skills with today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant takes a unique approach to learning, offering interactive, visually engaging lessons that teach you to think like a problem solver. What makes Brilliant stand out is its emphasis on hands-on exercises, giving you the opportunity to immediately apply what you learn. For example, you can start with the basics like conditional statements and loops, and then progress to full programming languages such as Python, which is actually very similar to Godot's GDScript. One of Brilliant's best features is how easily it fits in your schedule. The platform delivers bite-sized lessons, meaning that even with just a few minutes each day, you'll be making steady progress and, over time, these daily lessons will solidify your skills and deepen your understanding, helping you build the expertise you need. You can try Brilliant for free for 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash cashewalldew or you can simply scan the QR code to receive 20% off their premium annual subscription. Now, what if you wanted to add a DLC to your game? Or even better, what if you wanted to give players the opportunity to mod your game? Well, that can be done through resource packs. Resource packs are basically just small packages that we can export separately or even completely different projects and add them to our current game. So to do that, I have here a DLC folder which has some scenes, it has some other folder and so has this subscribe scene. And by the way, if this helps you, please subscribe. I really, really appreciate it. And now I want this subscribe scene to be used as a DLC. Okay, but now if I wanted to also export my game without this DLC, because it wouldn't make too much sense to have an exclusive package that's already included in the base product. So I could uh, go to project and export and under here, I'll make another copy of my Windows Runnable and I'll call it Windows Base, why not? And in here I can select everything except what is under DLC slash star. DLC is the name of the folder and star is anything that's under the folder is not going to get picked up by this export. Okay, but right now I do not wish to export this version because my base game needs to have some kind of way of communicating with a DLC if it exists. So how are we going to do that? Well, the simplest version is to go again to our main script and let's just add the scene. So we don't want to do anything fancy. We just want to spawn this scene in case the DLC exists. So what I'm going to do is first of all, call project settings. So project settings dot load resource pack. If I do this, I can select here any resource pack I want. And where do I want to store my resource packs? Well, now I have my resource packs stored under subscribe, but let's make a new folder. Let's call it DLC so that we have them all together here. I stored my pack under DLC. So I am expecting to get my package from where? From the root of my project. So res slash slash plus DLC slash subscribe.zip. 
Now this is going to either return true or false. So I'm just going to make a variable, call it var results or res. And we now check if the result was true or false. So if res, then what do we do? Well, we can simply instantiate the scene. So we're going to say var sub scene equals to what? Equals to load. And now we load the scene exactly as if we already had it in our game. So it would be simply just press DLC, subscribe, and subscribe.tscn. You know, we have it here as well. It's DLC, subscribe, and subscribe TSCN. Okay. And after we load this, we can add it as a child. So we can do add child and sub dot instantiate. Now, this is basically it with one small exception. Sadly, we are not going to be able to access this DLC subscribe zip because we are currently in the executable context. So our game, when looking in the res column slash slash directory is basically looking inside the executable. So if this were our game, cache clicker would look inside the exe and would basically find nothing there. But our DLC obviously is outside our executable in this DLC folder under subscribe.zip. So how do we refer to the outside of it? Well, to do that, we simply have to globalize this root path. So I'm just going to make a new variable and call it root. And let's make it equal to project settings dot globalize path and in here i'm just gonna write res column slash slash and now i can use this root and this resource is going to be collected from outside the executable and after it is loaded we can then look inside the executable to get the subscribe scene so this is the point in which this external dlc or file gets inside our executable and now after we access it, we should be able to see our subscribe scene. Okay, now what we can do is go to our project and hit export. Now, in here, we make sure that we have our Windows base selected because we want to avoid exporting these DLC files. And now, instead of export package or zip, we export a standalone project. And let's export it under the name cashewclicker.exe. I'm going to save. And if I were to look now in my folder, you see I have here cashewclicker.exe. If I run it, I have my subscribe button. Okay, but what if, for example, I do not have this DLC purchased? Well, I could simply remove this subscribe.zip. And now if I run my cashewclicker, you see that the subscribe button is no longer here. Now, to be honest, this is all you need to know to create DLCs for your game. However, if you wanted to automatically detect all the DLCs that are added to your DLC folder, let's say, I found a pretty nice solution from Godot Simon, which basically looks under the DLC folder and automatically loads the resource packs and loads the scenes. So I'm just going to do something similar just to showcase how that might work. I'm going to create a new script. So let's just create new script and let's call it DLC manager. Okay. And in this DLC manager, what I want to do is to identify this DLC folder. So let's say that my location for DLCs is DLC location, which is equal to DLC. And we want to do this when the game loads. So I'm just going to make a function called func init. And this is going to return a void. Okay, now we want to be able to get all the DLCs that are outside of our executable. So in order to do that, again, we need to set our root. So var root to be equal to project settings dot globalize path and again we globalize the path press column slash slash okay and our dlc files are going to be where well in our root directory 
we have the DLC folder in which we want to add our DLC files. So basically, we want to get all these files in this folder. And to do that, let's just make a new function. Let's say var DLC files equal to get files of root and yeah, the DLC location. So res and DLC. Okay, now let's actually define this function. So func get files of root, which is a string and location, which is also a string. And finally, we want to return a list of files that we found in the DLC directory. So we're going to return an array of string. Now from here, it's pretty easy because what we have to do is to open the current directory and loop through it to find all the files. Now to open the directory, we are going to use the dir access object. So var dir, which is of type dir access, and this is equal to dir access dot open and we open the current location. So it's going to be root plus location. Okay, after we opened this location, we need to have a list of files. So I'm just going to say var files, and this is an array of strings. And of course, this is for now empty. Okay, now how do we populate this list of files? Well, first of all, if we manage to open our directory, so if dir, what do we do? Well, we want to begin looking through our directory. And to begin looking, we just have to write dir dot list dear begin and we actually take a look at the file we're just gonna say var file is going to be equal to dear dot get next and now that we have a file this is either going to be the name of the actual file so maybe i don't know subscribe dot dscn or something else or it's going to be an empty string if there are no files left so basically our breaking condition is going to be that the file name is an empty string. So basically while our file is not equal to empty, we can keep looking. So what do we do when we keep looking? Well, first of all, we need to know what the actual file location is for this. So I'm just going to write var file location equals to location plus slash and plus file so i'm basically just building the current directory plus my file name okay and now we want to see if this location is either a file or a directory because if it's a directory we have to go deeper inside that directory to look for other files so i'm gonna say if tier dot current is directory then we are simply going to add the files from that directory to the files that we find now. So we're just going to do files plus equal to get files of root and this new file location. Now, otherwise, if this isn't a directory, it's simply a file. So we just add it to our array of files. So I'm just going to do files.append file location. Now, after checking the information about this file, we can finally go to the next one so that we do not stay in an infinite loop. So I'm just going to say file equals to dear dot get next. After we finish with our while, we only have to say, OK, finish looking through the directory. So dear dot list dear end. And after we finish looking, we simply return our files. So return files. And for some reason, if we didn't manage to open our directory, let's just return an empty array. Now, of course, we could return an error or something, but for now, let's keep things simple. Okay, now that we have a location for all our DLC files, we simply do exactly what we did before. So we loaded the resource pack for our new locations for our new zip files here. So I'm just going to do exactly the same thing which is simply iterate over each of these files. So for file path in DLC files, and I'm just going to do project settings dot load resource pack. And from here, I select the file path. And now since they are inside, we can again get them. So let's just say var DLC files from inside equals to get files of what? Well, this time we no longer get them from this outside root, but we get them from res column slash slash and DLC location, because this is where we wanted to store those files. Okay. And after we got these files, 
what was the next step? Well, after we loaded our resource pack, if whatever we loaded was okay, then we also loaded the scene. So now, just as we did in main, let's do the same thing. So just we do it for every file. So for file path of DLC files from inside, uh, and of course, I have to get rid of my JavaScript tendencies uh, for file path in DLC files from inside. Let's just say that we want to load the current file, so file path. Now, the issue is with this is that, of course, we load our file path, but we don't keep track of it anywhere. And it would be nice to have a reference to it. So let's maybe just make a dictionary. So var dlc loads, which is a dictionary. And let's attach to this dictionary the file that we just loaded. So let's just make dlc loads of file path equals to load file path. Now, there's gonna be a small issue with this. And the issue is that in our DLCs, we also have files which end with remap or with import. So if we want to actually load those files, we have to remove the remap and the import versions. So let's just make a variable called new path. So var new path and make this equal to string. Let's say that it's equal to file path dot replace what well we said remap so remap we replace remap with nothing and we also replace import with nothing again okay and instead of using this file path we use the new path good now all we need to do is to make this an auto load so if i go to project settings and to globals you'll see that here i can select my script which is the dlc manager and let's make it an auto load under the name DLC manager. And now we can access it anywhere in our code. After we did all this, we basically have a dictionary that holds all the loaded data from our DLCs. So now in our main.gd, instead of using this manual way of getting the DLCs, we could use our DLC manager. So let's just say var sub scene equals to what to dlc manager dot dlc loads of what well we want to get the file that's under dlc slash subscribe slash subscribe dot dscn okay and of course if we found this scene so if sub scene then we are simply going to add child of sub scene dot instantiate we save everything and okay and now if i am going to export this project i can export it again without the dlcs i can overwrite whatever was previously there and i can also export my sub dlc so let's export it as a package again because i think i deleted it previously so win dlc inside the dlc folder and let's see if we can also export something else maybe we don't want to pick a scene we want to pick some resources and let's export this other folder which has some resources so let's go to export win dlc dlc and here i'm gonna save not, not subscribe.zip but res.zip i'm gonna save it and now if i take a look i have res and subscribe and if i am going to run my cache clicker you see that i have subscribe here okay but if I were to, for example, delete this subscribe button and run the cache clicker again, you see that I no longer have this subscribe button. And now, of course, if we wanted to see that the other resources are loaded, then maybe whenever we found some of these files or whenever we added them to the dictionary, let's just print the new path as well. So let's just do a print new path. And now I'm going to do a quick export of our windows base export it as a project to cashew clicker and now if instead of the clicker i run the cashew clicker console you'll see that i'll have here all the other files that i added so hidden peanut lore the peanut king whatever and also an error specifying that hey you were trying to access dlc subscribe tscn and of course it's not there because we do not have this dlc now, finally, it's time to look at all the options that these templates provide to see what they actually mean. So to begin with, for Windows, we have here the custom template option. This is basically specifying if we want to make our own template 
with our own options. So we could add more options to this, or we could add encryption to our template and so on. Now the next one is debug, which basically specifies if we have a console attached to our game. So as you can see in the previous example, in our Windows DLC, we also had the possibility to run the game with a console attached. And this basically just printed everything that we would have seen in our console normally. Okay, now finally we have binary format and binary format allows us to embed the packages into our executable. So this is basically going to take this cashew clicker package and put it inside the exe and also the architecture which selects which kind of architecture this application is for. Now these texture formats might be quite confusing because they have a weird name and also the documentation doesn't explain too much about them. In a nutshell, S3TC is going to be used for textures which do not need to scale too much and ETC2 is quite the opposite for textures which have to scale and need to be more flexible. So you would generally use S3TC for a monitor, so basically for PC games, and ETC2 would be used for phone games. Now, the next one is code sign, and this is used to digitally sign your app, which basically shows users and operating systems that verify the game, that your game is the authentic version and not some kind of virus or weird modified game. This leads to fewer security warnings and eliminating friction that users might face when playing your game. So checking this will basically show up a bunch of new options regarding code sign. And to be honest, this is not the easiest thing to do in the world, but luckily the process is well documented in the Godot docs and I'll be adding that to the description. And additionally, if you're distributing your game on platforms which bypass the code signing or antivirus checks like Steam, you don't have to do this. Now, the next property we have is under application and it's called modify resources. This is basically just saying, hey, we are going to modify whatever Godot values had by default with the following resources. So after we check this, we can change this information. So for example, if I press on this and click on assets and select my cashew full PNG, and if I come here and do the same for my icon and my console wrapper icon, I can say export project, come here and save. And if I now go to my windows, you see that under exports, I have these new icons for my cache clicker game. And other things can happen as well. I could set some metadata, file version, product version, whatever, copyright. And the next interesting thing is export angle. And this helps with improving compatibility on systems with poor OpenGL support. So you want to use this when targeting older or less powerful hardware and you want to disable it when you don't need that kind of OpenGL translation. But generally, if you leave it on auto, it should be sufficient. Now, this next one is for Direct 3D, and it's basically used for giving better performance on high-end hardware that's using latest versions of Windows. Finally, there is this thing called Agility SDK Multi-Arch, and uh, this can be enabled if you want all users, no matter their Windows version, to have the same Direct3D version. So yeah, this would make your game a bit more reliable. Now, the last option we have here is SSH Remote Deploy, and if we enable it, you'll see that here we have a bunch of extra arguments, but what this does is that it lets you streamline your deployments on other devices or even on cloud. So this is super helpful if you're doing changes often and you need to quickly test and deploy on multiple devices. Okay, now if we move to Linux, this is basically the same. We don't have anything new here. Okay, now if we go to web, you see that again, we have the custom template, but here we have variant which basically says, okay, we support GD extensions and we support threads or not. And we have this VRAM texture comparison, which is for desktop and for mobile. And this is basically the equivalent of what we had here on Windows for our texture format. Remember when I said that S3C is more like for, remember when I said that S3TC is better for desktop and ETC2 is better for mobile? Well, here it's more clear that this is for desktop and this is for mobile. 
Now, the next thing we have is HTML. And in this HTML category, we have this export icon, which basically just sets the favicon of our web page. Now, what is a favicon or fav icon, I guess? Well, it's this icon here at the top. So as you can see, it really uses the Godot icon that we initially used. Now, the next property is a custom HTML shell, which basically wraps the exported web build and also includes this shell, which we can use to do some additional things. So if you look in the documentation, by default, we are using the HTML full size file, which is a pretty big file for our uh, game, but we could also use something simple like this. And uh, inside our engine.start game, we can use this HTML5 shell class reference to run different commands that we might want to run at the beginning of our page. So for example, we could uh, init the engine, we could preload some file and so on. Head include is used to add more tags to our HTML head. And this is generally used so that we can be discovered more easily by search engines. Canvas resize policy basically saying if our app is going to be able to resize or not. Focus canvas on start if we focus the game or not. And experimental virtual keyboard might be removed, might not be removed, but yeah, it can show a virtual keyboard for your game. Now, this progressive web app menu can be enabled and a bunch of properties can be added to it. But what is a progressive web app? Well, have you ever noticed this weird button on websites like YouTube? Well, this button allows us to download and install the web application on our machine, making it look and feel like an actual application. And the benefit of this is that you can provide offline functionality, push notifications and faster performance for your web game. For example, if I'm here on YouTube, I can click on this. You see that I can install the YouTube app. If I install it, I can now open it in a separate window, which acts again, just like YouTube would normally act. And even more, a YouTube app is added to my desktop. And if I double click this, you see that it opens YouTube which is not in a browser, you do not see it in a browser, it's acting really like an application. So now if we get back in Godot, we can enable the same thing for our app. And additionally, we can enable all these flags here, for example, ensure cross origin isolation headers, which was that property that we had to set in order to use multiple threading. We have offline page, which is a page on which uh, the application is going to take us if we have no connection to the internet or there are server hosting issues. There are display settings telling us that we want the app to be full screen, to be standalone, to have some UI elements from the browser or to be fully looking like it's in the browser. The orientation, landscape, portrait, any. This is generally because we usually want to put progressive web apps on a phone and of course the icons on their different resolutions and some background color. So if I enable my progressive web app, I can export my project as cashewclicker.html. And now if I look inside the folder, you see that I not only have the HTML for the cache clicker, but I also have an offline HTML, which will be used instead. Now, of course, I can modify this in any way I want, but for now, I'm going to leave it like that. And I'm just going to open the terminal again and serve my. And now if I go to cashewclicker.html, you see that I have this install cashew clicker button here. And if I click on this, yeah, it has the same icon. It's basically the same thing. I can install it. And you see now that it is a separate application and I can drag it and change its size and act with it like it would be just a game that I have exported on Windows. But since this is a PWA application, this basically works anywhere. Not only that, but I also have it now on my desktop. And whenever I want, I can just double click this and it's going to open localhost 8000. And you see, I have some things. Okay, now we can move on to Mac. Here we have a distribution type, and this is basically telling us which kind of build we're going to have. Testing means that we're going to have a debug build. 
and distribution means that we are going to have a release build. Again, we can have custom templates. Again, we can have an extra console wrapper and under application. And just as before, we can select the icon. We can select the type of interpolation for our icon, the bundle identifier, which is basically a unique ID in case we want to put this into the Apple store, a signature, an app category, which specifies the category of the application. Again, if we want to put it on the app store, short version and version, copyright, copyright localized, we know all these. And here we can also specify the macOS version. Export angle, just as before, is related to OpenGL settings. And additional plist content is basically a bunch of many other key value pairs that we could put here in an XML format, just as you see here in this example. For display, if we set high resolution, the application will be rendered at a native display resolution and otherwise it just upscales it when the OS requests. Xcode is basically just saying specification for Xcode, which builds the application executable. Code signed similarly to before for signing our application. Next, we have entitlements, which are used to ask for permission from the user basically to get maybe access to the camera or access to audio input or whatever. And now finally, we have notarization, which is used for code signing and is more specific to Apple. You see, we need an API key ID, API UID, and so on. And of course, the SSH remote deploy, which is similar to what we had before, but this time it's for Mac. Now, moving on to Android, we have again our custom template, and then we have a Gradle build. This Gradle build is just a different way of building, and generally it's used when people work with. Android Studio, and if you're familiar with that, you might like that more. We have different architectures and we have a key store. Now, for uploading your game to the Play Store, you need to have it signed using a non-debug key store file. So to generate such a file, we need to use the Java key tool. Now, if you remember before, we have specified our environment variables and if we look here under path, you'll see that we have this Java JDK 23 bin. Now, why do we have those variables? Because under Java JDK 23 bin, we have a bunch of apps that we could use. And among these apps, we also have key tool. If I open a CMD, I can access this key tool.exe because I have my environment variable set. So I could write key tool and you see that I get a list of things that key tool can do. Now, for example, I could be using this key tool dash V dash gen key on whatever. I'm going to give you the command anyway, but this basically just specifies that, hey, my key store is going to be named my key key store with an alias. It's going to use the RSA algorithm and it's going to be valid for 10,000 units, which I'm not sure what are, maybe seconds, maybe days, hours. <laughs> okay, now if I run this, you'll see that it's going to ask me for a password. And I can say one, two, three, four, five, six, please don't choose this password. And again, one, two, three, four, five, six again. And now it's asking me for a name and for a bunch of information. So last name, cashew, uh, organizational unit, um, due, old due for some reason, I don't get the first letter, but it's okay city, new land, state or province, new some two letter country code, DD. And it's asking me if this is correct. And I say, why? And basically it generated my key store. And now if I run LS, sorry, I'm not on Linux. If I run dir, I should be able to see my key store being generated. And as you can see here, I have my key dot key store. And now the next thing to do is to simply go to my key store release and let's select new file. And I can go to C slash user slash all you where my key has been generated. And you see here, I have my key dot key store and I open it. And if I write here one, two, three, uh, actually the user, which was my name, I don't remember cash you maybe <laughs> and the password one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I'll have this key store set. But yeah, that's basically it. 
Now, for the version is the version that I want to set and it's incremented for each new release. And this is the name of the version that I want to show to the actual users. And for package, similarly to what we had for macOS, we have to specify some unique identifier for our package. And of course, some name for our game to see if it's signed or not, the category of the app, just as before, and if it shows on Android TV or not. Next, we have launcher icons. Again, pretty simple, just some icons. We have something that tells us if we support extended reality or not. So maybe you want to look through VR glasses with your phone. And next we have screen information, which tells us which kind of screen we support. We can allow user data backup and also a bunch of other huge amount of permissions, which basically tell us what our application can do to the phone of the user. So for example, we could ask for permissions to make the phone vibrate or maybe ask for permissions to see the camera or so on and so forth. Now, on top of everything that I've shown you, there are also these two other tabs. One is for encryption, which can be used to encrypt your files. But the main issue with this is that if you want to use this feature, you have to compile your own template. And the process of compiling your own template, honestly, is subject for a whole other video because it's it's a bit more complex than I could show in this one. And uh, finally, we have scripts, which allow us to say how we want to export the scripts. And of course, we can export them as compressed or binary tokens. But for easier debugging, it's important to know that we can use text when exporting these scripts. So we could basically go line by line and see what actually happens. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So see ya.